Coming up on our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1185 of This Week in Amateur Radio. It looks like the Dayton Hamvention will happen in 2022. We will have the details so far. The October Volunteer Monitor Program report has been released. We will tell you who has been naughty and who has been nice on the ham bands. You will be able to rediscover radio at the upcoming ARRL National Convention and Orlando Hamcation, both coming up in February 2022. We will have the details. Norway is looking to introduce a new entry-level amateur license aimed primarily at young people. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring Report is out. We will familiarize you with all of the interfering signals on the low bands. The Wireless Institute of Australia has met with that country's regulator, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, about the future of amateur radio in that country. We will tell you about the results. Speaking of Australia, the new Australian 2x1 contest call signs hit the air during a recent contest, and we will tell you how they were received. And... If you are a new amateur with a modest HF station and are considering jumping into contesting, we will have the top 10 tips for new contesters prepared by John Bartscherer, N1GNV. All of these headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, asks the question, are you afraid of technology? And he will talk about a recent FCC ruling on the demise of cable card technology. Australia's own Anno Ben Schaff, VK6FLAB, asks, what have you been up to in amateur radio lately? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to November 22, 1967, the date that the FCC instituted incentive punishment. I, I, I mean incentive licensing. The year that hams lost operating frequencies and pitted amateurs against the FCC and amateurs against the ARRL. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about climbing your tower and taking a turn to the left or right, or how to safely work on tower sidearms. All of that and a whole lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here just outside Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from the western Catskills of upstate New York, where the geese are flying south for the winter because it's too far to walk, I'm Don Hulick with the Dad Jokes, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from a cold, rainy, and blustery Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric. Katie G, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Autumn and Old Man Winter are in the middle of the battle royal with the fall colors the main victim, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off our news this week, it looks like the Dayton Hamvention 2022 is not just going to be a premier ham fest, but a reunion, as organizers prepare for the first gathering at the Xenia Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Ohio after two years of cancellations due to the pandemic. Hamvention's General Chairman Rick Elnett, WS8G, said that committees have been meeting and volunteers are committed to making up for the time lost to two years of cancellations. Hamvention will be happening on Friday, May 20th through Sunday, May 22nd, with an international reception scheduled on Thursday, May 19th. W8SG went on to say that the registration site is already taking bookings from vendors and inside exhibitors, and individual visitors can already buy their tickets. 
All details are available on the hamvention.org website. Rick said all the tickets are all printed and ready to go. We will bring you further updates from the Hamvention as they become available. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. The following is the October Volunteer Monitor Program report. Technician operators in Yarmouth Port, Massachusetts and Richmond, Texas received advisory notices after making numerous FT8 contacts on 40 and 20 meters. Technician licensees are not allowed to transmit data on 40 meters and have no operating authority on 20 meters. Operators in Mims, Florida, Moorfield, West Virginia, State Road, North Carolina, and Grotos, Virginia received advisory notices concerning excessive SSB bandwidth on 40 and 75 meters. The operator in Moorfield, West Virginia previously received an advisory notice for out-of-band operation on 7.138 MHz. His case will be referred to the FCC for further enforcement action, which could include removal of voice privileges from or revocation of his general class license. An operator in Cave Creek, Arizona received an advisory notice for making lengthy transmissions without identifying as required by commission rules. An operator in Highlandville, Missouri was reminded that a beacon on 30 meters cannot be automatically controlled pursuant to Part 97.203 Subpart D of the Commission's rules and must have a control operator present at all times of transmission. He was further advised that the FCC may request a schedule of control operators and their duty hours. The final totals for monitoring in September were 1,909 hours on HF frequencies and 2,716 hours on VHF frequencies and above, for a total of 4,625 hours. There was one recommendation to the FCC for case closure and renewal of a license, and one request to review a license application. The FCC referred two cases to the Volunteer Monitor Program. We thank VM Program Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this month's report. Norway is planning to introduce a 10-watt entry-level license that will enable young people 12 to 13 years old to get started building simple transmitters and receivers. The Norwegian Research Council has given 1 million kroner, or approximately $116,000, to support the project to recruit young radio amateurs. A translation of a post by Sweden's SSA reads, Within the framework of its program, Strength of Children and Young People's Digital Competence and Understanding of Digital Technology, the Norwegian Research Council has allocated one million kroner to the project Radio Communications Technology for Young People. The project is carried out by NRRL and the Research Institute of Forsvatten, and the project manager is Torbjorn Skauli, LA4ZCA, the project aims to increase interest in technology and science in schools. The idea is to introduce amateur radio as a kind of freely chosen work in the high schools. The project also includes developing an entry-level certificate that allows 12 and 13 year olds to get started with amateur radio. Norway's communications regulator, NKOM, has received clear directives and work is now done to design certificate requirements and conditions. The project has a clear focus on the marker space phenomenon and wants to encourage young people to start by building simple transmitters and receivers. Therefore, you want a low power limit of a maximum of 10 watts to avoid interference from home-built appliances. Torbjorn who is a professor at FFI, has previous experience from voluntary code workshops in the school where children are taught to program. An important challenge for programming, marker spaces, and amateur radio is to get dedicated and trained teachers who can drive the business forward once the project has been ended. SSA looks forward to interesting cooperation with NRRL in this area. The San Francisco Chronicle newspaper reports that ham radio operators are the go-to communicators in earthquake preparation drills. The newspaper reported that at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday in October, Skip Fidanzo, Kilo Juliet 6 Alpha Romeo Lima, was expecting a Richter Level 8 earthquake on the Hayward Fault, a geological fault zone capable of generating destructive earthquakes. It's about 74 miles long and situated mainly along the western base of the hills on the east side of San Francisco Bay. 
Well, assuming his own home doesn't go sliding down Ring Mountain, Fidanzo was set to make his way past his mobile phone, past his laptop and landline, and heading straight for the garage for the only communication method he can count on to be still working, ham radio. Setting up in his rocking chair at a window with a view stretching from Mount Tamalpais to San Francisco Bay, Fidanzo's plan has him starting to make radio calls, which should bring a response from any or all of 15 ham radio operators spread from Novato to Point Reyes Station. And Operation Golden Eagle, an orchestrated region-wide emergency response exercise, will be on the air. The simulation involves five Bay Area counties where emergency service professionals exchange requests for information and resources after the presumed disaster. But only Marin amongst the five counties are operating without internet or mobile phone capabilities. Instead, Marin is employing a network of amateur radio hobbyists who call themselves radio communications volunteers. Acting under supervision of the Marin County Department of Public Works, the volunteers are providing vital communications between the Emergency Operations Centre and community-based organisations that serve the most vulnerable residents. The goal is that the County Board of Supervisors will certify the radio communications volunteers as part of its official emergency response. The idea is that good old reliable ham radio technology, antenna to antenna, without reliance on cell towers, satellite dishes or cables, will be a vital tool when 21st century technology stops working. Fidanzo expects this to happen the moment the real life disaster hits. You can read more at www.sfchronicle.com. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and the Orlando Amateur Radio Club will hold the 2022 ARRL National Convention and Orlando Hamcation February 10th through the 13th, 2022, in Orlando, Florida. The convention theme, Rediscover Radio, is a rallying call for radio amateurs committed to developing knowledge and skills in radio technology and radio communication. The convention will kick off on Thursday, February 10th with a series of day-long ARRL training tracks and a national convention luncheon at the Doubletree by Hilton Hotel Orlando at SeaWorld. Registration is open now at www.arrl.org expo and an early bird registration rate is in effect through December 15th. Hamcation will host the rest of the convention on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, February 11th through the 13th, 2022, at the Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando, an 87-acre lakefront fairgrounds. Orlando Amateur Radio Club President John Knott, N4JTK, noted that holding the convention in 2022 will mark the 75th anniversary of Hamcation one of the largest annually held gatherings of radio amateurs in the United States. The published gate figure for 2020 was 24,200 for all three days. We want our Diamond Anniversary show to be an exciting five-star event, said Not. We look forward to seeing you in Orlando in February. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System newsletter reports that October also brought us a large number of troublemakers that often massively interfere with amateur radio. As always, in the first place were the over-the-horizon radars, especially, of course, the well-known Russian container over-the-horizon radar. Also, the British radar from the United Kingdom base in Cyprus was massively more often active, particularly in the 15, 17, and 20-meter band, using 25 and 50 sweeps per second. A different over-the-horizon radar from China was present daily on several frequencies, so the one known under the nickname Foghorn, obviously also using different sweep rates, were mostly 10 kHz wide. In addition, the low bands were often badly influenced by 160 kHz wideband radar with 10 sweeps per second. On 10 meters, the Iranian over-the-horizon radar was active almost daily mostly for hours, and recently on other frequencies and with partly new sweep rates. So, alternately, 150 to 313 sweeps per second, as well as 225 to 334 sweeps per second, or 315 to 870 sweeps per second were observed. It also changes frequencies more often, and no longer transmits for hours on a single QRG. However, we must be aware that we are not talking about hundreds of different radars, but objectively only a few sites that operate on different frequencies and with partly different sweep rates. 
This is also true for many other digital emissions. So let's not fool ourselves. It would be a self-deception. In addition to over-the-horizon radars, as usual, numerous digital transmissions from east and west were also noticeable, mostly military, such as CIS-12, CHN-30, Link-11 SLU and CLU, MIL-188, and various FSK stations with different bandwidths and baud rates, originating mostly from CIS states. Depending on propagation conditions, some well-known familiar broadcast stations were also audible almost daily in Europe, including Radio Ethiopia on 7110 kHz with an often very strong signal. Also, other stations were heard from time to time, if conditions permitted. During October, the Wireless Institute of Australia met with the Australian Communications and Media Authority, their regulating body, to discuss several important topics, including the new class licensing proposals, how the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency criteria of EMR compliance will integrate with the potentially new amateur licensing structure in Australia and some of the finer points of the 2 by one call signs and the five-year spectrum outlook and the effects it will have on amateur radio communities long term. The ACMA welcomed the opportunity to meet with the WIA and were accepting that the previous very detailed submission on amateur licensing arrangements provided the ACMA with significant details and knowledge to consider. With respect to amateur licensing arrangements, ACMA advises that the submission to the ACMA authority was almost complete and would go forward shortly. The next step once approved is to proceed with a response to submissions and suggested steps going forward. This will most likely occur in the January and February time frame of 2022, which has historically been a busy time for both the WIA and the ACMA. The ACMA advised that the update on the changes for the amateur service related to APSMA MEME standards. The ACMA would consist of the intention to lift the current requirements from the apparatus into the new regulatory framework. There's no intention to impose any additional burden on amateurs. The WIA finds that this is an exceptional approach as any changes would entail a large educational requirement and that education in this area would be a necessity anyway. The 2 by one contest call signs have been a great success and ACMA is not considering imposing any further operating conditions. It will be up to the amateur community to come up to a consensus that is reflective of the international view of contesting criteria and appropriate use of the 2 by one contesting call sign. ACMA mentioned because they're working on the assignment process for the assignment of repeater and beacon apparatus licenses. It's acknowledged that as of the WIA's role in international band plans, discussions with the ACMA and other parties are ongoing, with the WIA developing a framework document for comment as a way of programming to a suitable arrangement. The outcome and discussions were robust, and the WIA thanked the ACMA for scheduling the WIA into their very busy schedule. A full report will be released shortly on the WIA website. The German National Amateur Radio Society, DARC, has been describing how a case of interference in the amateur radio 40 meter band, where amateurs are the primary user, was being caused by an AM broadcasting station in Tashkent. Well, it seems the situation was speedily dealt with. On October the 22nd, there was an AM broadcast on 7160 kHz between 18 and 1815 hours UTC. Due to the transmission power of the broadcast radio station and the breadth of the commercial A3E signal, there was considerable impairment of radio traffic in the 7155 to 7165 kHz range over large parts of Europe and the Middle East. The frequency range 7000 to 7200 kHz is exclusively assigned to the Amateur Radio Service in accordance with the Ordinance on the Amateur Radio Act. Germany's Bandwatch organization, led by Daniel Muller, Delta Lima 3 Romeo Tango Lima, contacted the company responsible, Media Broadcast, to investigate the case. Media Broadcast said that the mistake was made by a contracted relay station in Tashkent, the capital city of Uzbekistan. The exact cause is still being investigated. The provider there had actually been commissioned by Media Broadcast to broadcast on 6040 kHz in the 49 meter radio band. The Bandwatch team were assured that this was a one-off incident and the broadcaster apologized for the inconvenience. Brazil's National Amateur Radio Emergency Network Coordinator, Hilton Libaroni, 
PY2BBQ reports that Sao Paulo State Network of Emergency Radio Amateurs volunteers were directly involved in a search and rescue operation with the Sao Paulo State Fire Department after a cave collapsed on October 31st during a rescue exercise in Altinopolis. 28 civil firefighters were carrying out an exercise in the Duas Bocas cave when part of the cave collapsed, leaving nine dead. Search and rescue operations were carried out by the Sao Paulo Fire Department with support from the State Civil Defense. RERSP played an important role in providing communication between the incident command post and the rescue area, which proved difficult to access. To overcome this distance, it was necessary to walk between 30 and 40 minutes along a narrow trail in dense forest, Liberoni said. The RERSP volunteers involved started the work in the early hours in the morning, continuing until 8 p.m. The participation of radio amateurs was effective, providing infrastructure and radio equipment to facilitate communication between the command post and the rescue teams who were out of contact due to lack of telephone or internet signal. The support of radio amateurs made operations more agile, enabling the command to receive and transmit messages directly to the rescue team. More than 12 individual radio amateurs had a direct role in the rescue operation, with the support of dozens of hams who supplied the teams with information and technical data. Both the national and state emergency networks are administered by the civilian defense in each level with the aid of Brazil's national amateur radio organization, LABRE, Liga de Amadores Brasileiros de Radio Emissão. The long-awaited 2 by one VK contest call signs got their first official run on the air during the big CQ Worldwide SSB contest in late October. The Wireless Institute of Australia reports an assignment of the calls by the Australian Maritime College came just in time for the global competition. In fact, three of the Wireless Institute of Australia's own directors were assigned the calls for use in competition. Some reports say that many amateurs who heard the new contest calls were at first confused by the unusual single-letter suffixes, but everything ultimately ran smoothly. If you have thoughts you'd like to share about Australia's new contest call signs, the WIA is eager to hear your comments. Send them on to their national office at wia.org.au. AMSAT North America President Robert Bankston, KE4AL, told the 2021 AMSAT Dr. Tom Clark K3IL Memorial Space Symposium on October 30th that the organization is looking ahead to the future satellite missions, but will go commercial in order to keep enough satellites in space. Bankston, who was re-elected at a virtual board meeting on October 29th, said AMSAT is in solid financial position and donations are healthy. Bankston said membership numbers are holding strong, with more than 4,000 members in 76 countries, and that recent administrative modernization has reduced overhead costs by more than 30%. Vice President of Development, Frank Karnauskas, N1UW, despite AMSAT's solid financial standing, additional funds are needed to design, build, and launch satellites. Consequently, AMSAT is ramping up its grant writing efforts, applying for grants from philanthropic organizations and corporate sponsors. Bankston said AMSAT's strategic plan prioritizes putting satellites into high Earth orbits. He also summarized the Gulf, or Greater Orbit Larger Footprint Initiative, as part of its plan to reach higher orbits. AMSAT will not be giving up on low Earth satellites, FM CubeSats. However, FM satellites are very important and can serve as a stepping stone to more sophisticated spacecraft, Bankston said. AO-91 and AO-92 are living on borrowed time, so new initiatives are in order. Banks has said purchasing commercial satellites can shorten the development time. AMSAT plans to purchase a VU-1 UFM CubeSat, powered by four lithium-ion cells, but the board said 90% of funding would have to be obtained from external sources. This would not be a permanent approach, however. Bankston said the organization will be seeking additional volunteers to put its plans in action. Any expansion of the strategic plan will need more volunteers, Bankston said, adding that current volunteers are pretty much have full bandwidth. Vice President Engineering Jerry Buxton, 
N0JY reviewed satellite projects in the pipeline. These include providing a linear transponder module to the University of Maine for its MESAT-1 set to launch in 2022. The Golf T or Technology Evaluation Environment CubeSat is under construction and has been added to a launch manifest tentatively for the summer of 2022. Supply chain issues are impacting construction. Golf 1 is planned for delivery one year after the completion of Golf T. Bankston mentioned new regulations that will govern satellite launches in the future. The orbital debris assessment regulations complicate the design and licensing of Golf 3U platforms, however. A new AMSAT award program was announced to recognize the contribution of rover stations to the world of grid hunting. The award is called the Reverse VUCC Award, or VUCC slash R. Ernia could be tough. Rather than contacting a set number of grids per band, the goal is to make contacts from a set number of grids per band. AMSAT took over the issuance of this award from Central States VHF Society in September. The number of grids coincides with the ARRL award. Also, as of November 1st, FM contacts will no longer be accepted towards the Robert W. Barbie Jr. W4AMI award. A consensus of AMSAT board members expressed concern over the demands being placed on the limited availability of FM satellite repeaters. The Barbie award requires the submission of 1,000 satellite contacts via Oscar 6 or later satellites. Endorsements are available. The AMSAT board also heard reports from officers and representatives. The 2021 AMSAT Dr. Tom Clark K3IO Memorial Space Symposium and annual general meeting is available on AMSAT's YouTube channel. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Is technology scary? I've been, one, I've been wondering this. We have a lot of movies about technology gone wild, you know, Terminator. There's a lot of movies about computers, you know, war games and computers just kind of, you know, gaining. I think the thing that scares us most is that like they'll they'll gain sentience. They'll be they'll be like aware. That's that's scary, I guess. HAL 9000 seemed nice at the time, seemed like a nice computer at the time. Didn't seem like a bad guy, kind of helpful. Could play a really good game of chess. And then it locked Dave out of the pod bay door, man. That's not cool, man. Not okay. Technology, I think, is neutral. I don't know. Is it? What do you think? I think it's neutral. I think it's, um, I think some people would argue, oh, no, technology is always good. And yeah, when it comes to things like, um, I don't know, zippers, those are good. Light bulbs, those are good. Although, I guess, you know, you can always, there's always the counter argument. There's a counter argument on zippers I won't go into, but there are some gentlemen who prefer not to wear zippers. There's also the issue of light. You know, we're not, our, our biology is not used to light between sundown and sunrise. And so, you know, all this, all this light, especially the blue kind, blue light, really bad. I mean, there's, so there's that. You could argue that there's some technology that seems pretty bad on the face of it. Maybe the atom bomb. But there's still an argument there. I think it's basically neutral. It's what we do with it, right? And I was thinking about this this morning in the shower, which is my favorite technology. Thank you, Archimedes or whoever, <laughs> for figuring that one out. Nice job. We needed that. That was a, that was a, good, uh, a good, good catch, good find. Shower, bath. Actually, I've been reading a great book called Clean about the history of bathing. He talks about the Middle Ages. He said some historians call it a thousand years without a bath. <laughs> it's a fascinating book. You know, our our, uh, our attitude toward cleanliness has shifted back and forth. Now, right now, we're all about being clean. Wash your hands, 20 seconds, right? We're all, isn't that weird? We're learning how to wash our hands like we didn't know. Like you have to have videos and new Apple Watch coming out sometime any minute now. Maybe even this week. It's got a little hand washing routine in it. Ah, I see you're washing your hands. Would you like some help? If you ask your Amazon Echo to play the hand washing song, it'll sing a song for 20 seconds. A really terrible song. Makes you want to wash your hands faster. So the, I think medical technology, that's probably good, right? 
Well, yeah. I think it's what we do with it. And that's one of the things that has made my uh, career, really. It's, it's always been the principle behind what I do. And I've been doing this now since the 70s. Wow. Long time. Uh, which is, I like technology. I love technology. I like to play with it, right? But I also think it's important to understand it and to use it uh, intelligently, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't think if you, if I don't, I think if you don't understand it, then it, there's a tendency to say, oh, it's magic. That's probably not a good approach. It isn't magic. It's science. Technology, if you really think about it, is scientific theory made whole, made real, which is really cool. I'll give you a good example. The theory of relativity. Now, you would think, well, that's blue sky. There's nothing that can do with that, right? We wouldn't have GPS if it weren't for the theory of relativity. GPS satellites have to account for the fact that they're moving and that they, uh, they have to adjust for the fact that they're at a different gravitational plane. It's all sorts of interesting things that we wouldn't be able to do without even stuff that seems so blue sky. So technology it wouldn't exist without deep scientific understanding. And that's the thing. If you don't if you're scared of technology, well, <sighs> I understand. I don't I don't blame you, I guess, but uh surely we can uh, we can figure it out together. So I guess that's kind of my job is that is so to help you understand it, help you use it most importantly, cuz you know what? There people are going to use it against us <laughs> if we don't we don't learn how to use it ourselves. So it's good to understand it. It is being used by governments and marketers in all sorts of ways that we may not approve of. So it's important to understand that. That's what we talk about. This is probably pretty inside baseball, but I know some of you, like me, uh, use a cable card. You know what that is, a cable card? This is a thing the FCC used to, used to require. Uh, the cable companies offer you so you could use your own gear instead of having to use the cable company's box or DVR. The cable card was a really kind of neat idea. It was a credit card device for people, old timers, internet technology people going back a ways. You would recognize it as what we used to call a PCMCIA card. PCMCIA. Yeah, that, that card. It was like a credit card, but it had electronics in it. And the idea was, it was like kind of like, nowadays you could do it with a SIM card, truthfully. But this was this is an old technology, been around a long time. Nowadays you could do it with a SIM card. But uh, in the old days, and the cable company still seems to be living in the old days, they would make this PCMCIA card that you could... I left out an M, didn't I? PCMCIA. It's a lot of letters. Card that you would put in a device like a TiVo, for instance, and it would bake it the cable box so you didn't have to use the junky cable box the cable company provided. And you'd rent it from them. They're making a little money on it, a couple bucks, five bucks, something like that. FCC has just ruled, put out a little ruling, didn't didn't really pay any, you know, didn't make a big deal about it. And didn't, it didn't get a lot of attention because I think it's a, it's a small market. But thank goodness for David Zatz of ZatzNotFunny.com. Because if it weren't for him, I might not even be uh, be aware of this. But I use I have three cable cards in my house, three TiVos, three cable cards. The FCC has, in effect, said we are eliminating a proceeding in which we saw a comment on the adoption of new regulations for navigation devices. That's what the FCC calls them. Devices consumers use to access video programming and other services offered over multi-channel video programming networks, cable networks. And... Here's the important part. Eliminate outdated cable card support and reporting requirements. FCC said, don't worry, the market will keep the cable card alive. I don't know. According to the FCC, there are half a million cable cards in circulation, and they drop every year about 10%. People aren't using them anymore. You know why? <laughs> Not because everybody's saying, oh, I got to use that Comcast box or that Cox box or the Spectrum box. No, because people are saying, I just need Internet. Just give me Internet. I'm 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 curious what you think. Yesterday, Dick D. Bartol and I were talking about predictions. We had we had read back my predictions from 2009, which were wildly inaccurate. But I'm going to make an, another prediction, maybe possibly wildly inaccurate. I don't even think it's going to take ten years. Maybe it'll take uh, five. But more and more of us are going to start getting our our content over the top, you know, through the internet, not through the cable company. And that really, in the long run, it might make more sense for eliminating cable cards 
just eliminate cable. See, that's not what the cable company wants, but I think that may be the unintended consequence of this. Just eliminate the cable uh, and go over the internet. And of course, I think most cable companies realize that's the future and are starting to offer more and more on-demand stuff over the internet. And of course, certainly the content companies know that's the future. That's why all of a sudden there's HBO Max and Peacock and uh, Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus. These are all over-the-top streaming networks where you you pay a fee a monthly fee ranging from five to fifteen dollars a month hulu is another one and you get your uh, tv from the internet will it be cheaper no no uh <laughs> i don't think so there are right now freeways there's a uh, an app maybe you've seen it called lowcast l-o-c-a-s-t that lets you watch tv your local channels free i don't know how they're getting away with this but somehow they are so there, are, and there's people talk, tell, always write into me, say, you can, it's cheaper. You can get Pluto or other inexpensive solutions, ad supported solutions. And that, that's probably the case. That'll probably live, live on. Then you have to add the internet. And of course, the cable companies aren't dumb. The price of internet access is slowly going up, right? I called, Com I called Comcast to get a, a faster service and, and no bandwidth caps because they, they, they cap you out at a terabyte, which I run through pretty quickly. And then it's, what, I don't know, $50 for, or 10 gigabytes or something. It's expensive. So I said, can, is there anything, no bandwidth? They said, oh, yes, we can do that for you. I said, can, and how fast can I go? Oh, you can go to gigabit. I said, you're kidding. I had no idea you offered that. Yeah. And you know what? It's going to cost you less than you're paying right now. I said, how is that? He said, our special one-year offer. And now I remember. I did this a couple of years ago. Our special offer, it's only 99 bucks. But you forget that it's only for a year or two after the term runs out, whoosh, it gets really expensive. Whoosh. And they figure you by this time you're you're you know, you're captive. You're not either not gonna notice. So I got more service, better service for less money. I'm even paying for phone service from uh, Xfinity that I don't use. I don't want an Xfinity phone. I don't want a phone at all. Who has landlines anymore? I got a cell phone. What do I need a phone for? But it's cheaper if I get the service. Figure that out. Triple play is cheaper than the double play. Oh, yeah, because in a year, whoop, goes. <laughs> so I put a little note to myself in my calendar, my future self. I should send an email to my future self. Future self, don't forget, <laughs> talk to Comcast and get them, get it the new package deal because the price is about to go way up. This is the world we live in now. This really is it. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Mention November 22nd to many people in the U.S., and they will immediately associate it with the date that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But for amateur radio operators, especially those licensed for more than 40 years, it means something totally different. Incentive licensing. In a three-stage process starting on November 22, 1967 and ending on November 22, 1969, the FCC instituted incentive licensing, ostensibly designed to encourage amateurs to upgrade, but in reality a process under which most amateurs lost up to 50% of the frequencies they usually operated. Incentive licensing, or incentive punishment as some have called it, has been blamed for the demise of many American amateur radio equipment manufacturers such as Hammerland and Halicrafters, a temporary decline in the number of licensed hams, and bitter feelings against the ARRL and the FCC that last to this day. As we approach the 40th anniversary of incentive licensing, let's take a look at the events that led up to this controversial decision. In order to do so, we must go back to 1951. Prior to 1951, a rather simple license structure existed in this country. Amateurs had a Class A, Class B, or Class C license. Class A conveyed all amateur privileges on all frequencies, including exclusive access to the 75 and 20 meter phone bands. Class A required passing a comprehensive theory exam and a 13 word per minute CW test, which included sending as well as receiving. Class B conveyed all CW privileges on all bands and allowed phone operation on 160, 
11, and 10 meters in the HF spectrum and on all VHF and UHF frequencies. Note that 75 and 20 meter phone operation was limited to Class A hams. What about 40 and 15 meters? Well, 40 at that time was CW only. And as for 21 megacycles, it wasn't a ham band back then. 15 meters was given to us in 1947 in exchange for the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment of 20 meters, but the 15 meter band actually wasn't available to hams until 1952. In addition, 160 meter access was severely restricted at that time because of the Loran radio navigation and 11 meters was a secondary U.S. only allocation with limited popularity. So, the Class B ham who wanted HF phone operation went to 10 meters by default. Class B hams passed the same 13 words per minute code test as Class A, but a less comprehensive written test. Class C gave the same exact privileges as Class B, but the exam was given by mail under the supervision of a Class B or higher license to those who couldn't walk the 175 miles uphill both ways through the snow to a quarterly FCC examination point. In 1951, the FCC reorganized the entire license structure. Class A was replaced by the advanced, Class B by the general, and Class C by the conditional. Three new licenses were created at that time, the extra, technician, and novice. The extra, actually amateur extra, had a 20 words per minute code requirement and a written exam more difficult than the old Class A. In order to qualify for the extra, one needed to be licensed as a Class B or general for at least two years in addition to passing the test. However, if you held a Class B or general license or higher and you were licensed prior to April 1917, you could get an extra with no additional test. Technicians had to pass the general theory and a five words per minute CW test. They had privileges above 220 megacycles only. Novices had a basic 20 question written exam, the five words per minute code test, and limited CW privileges on 80, 11, and two meters, as well as voice privileges on two meters. This was a one year non-renewable license. The advance was available until December 31st, 1952 for upgrades or new licenses, at which time it was withdrawn from availability. Those holding advanced class licenses could continue to renew, but no new licenses were issued. In 1952 and 1953, the FCC also dropped a couple of other surprises. Phone operation was allowed for the first time on 40 meters, 15 meters was finally opened, the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment of the 20 meter band was removed from the amateur service, and in the biggest bombshell of them all, generals, former class B, and conditionals, former class C, were given access to all former exclusive class A phone frequencies. Now the conditional, general, advanced, and extra class operators had the exact on-the-air privileges. During the 1950s, novices were given 40 and 15 meter CW privileges in addition to their 80 meter segment and 11 meters was removed. Technicians got 6 meters in 1955 and the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters in 1959. Technicians could also hold a novice class license simultaneously. Many amateurs were unhappy with this structure. Extras complained that they had to go through a two-year waiting period as a general or advanced, had to pass a difficult test, and yet received no exclusive frequencies for their efforts. Advanced class amateurs were upset with the limbo status of their licenses, the fact that they no longer held the highest class license, and the fact that they no longer had exclusive use of 75 and 20 meter phone. General advanced and extra class amateurs complained that novices should not have been given 15 meter CW. The general advanced and extra class hams were also opposed to increasing technician class privileges for reasons we will see in our next installment. In summary, although the vast number of hams were satisfied, a small minority had complaints, and the ARRL listened. In 1963, acting on complaints they claim they received from members and operators in other countries, the ARRL proposed incentive licensing. In an editorial, the ARRL implied that perhaps it was a mistake 
when the Class B and Generals were given the 75 and 20 meter phone segments. The ARRL stand was now clear. Exclusive frequencies must be restored to the advanced and extra class amateurs in order to give generals an incentive to upgrade. Of course, what was left unsaid was that in order to do so, frequencies would have to be taken away from the general class hams. What was the ARRL's original proposal? How did hams react to it? What was the controversy about the technician class license that was dragged to the forefront in this battle? Be on board next time for the answers. This year marks the centennial of the beverage antenna. Many of you have heard of the beverage, patented in 1921 by Harold Beverage, but you might not really understand the concept. Recently, Steve Ford, WB8IMY, interviewed Ward Silver, N0AX, for ARRL's Eclectic Tech Podcast. Ward explained why a long wire not far above ground makes a superior receiving antenna for 160 and 80 meters. It prefers to receive vertically polarized signals coming in from the ionosphere in the direction of the wire. Every other direction, whether it's uh, uh, or polarization for that matter, are more or less rejected by the antenna. And that's how it rejects noise. It only receives uh, signals from this one direction at a, pref a preferred angle. And so uh, it sort of has this little cone where it, uh, it works the best. And if you aim that cone in the right direction, well, how about that? You get uh, a better signal to noise ratio. You might get more signal on your transmit antenna, but you also get so much more noise that you can't hear the signal. And that's uh, why you use beverage. Ward Silver, N0AX, talking with Steve Ford, WB8IMY, on ARRL's Eclectic Tech Podcast. And now, with this week's propagation forecast report, we go back to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who reports from League Headquarters. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports sunspot activity and solar flux dropped during the reporting week of November 4th through the 10th with average daily sunspot numbers retreating from 67.6 to 36.4 and the solar flux dropping from 102 to 89.1. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, offers her take on the space weather outlook. Amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you're probably noticing there's a lot less noise on the bands with all the big M flare players going away. But then again, also the solar flux has dropped a little bit. So radio propagation may not be quite as good for you. We're kind of sitting at the marginal range. And sadly, that's the way it's going to be for the rest of this week. The space weather woman, Tampa Scove, WX6SWW. Robert Marston, Alpha Alpha 6 X-Ray Echo, has reported on the progress of Solar Cycle 25 in October 2021. The mean solar flux was 89 and the monthly mean sunspot number was 38. The solar flux is up a couple of ticks from the previous month, while the sunspot number is down 26% from 52 recorded in September. While the drop in sunspot count is considerable, October's number is still the second highest of solar cycle 25. The October daily sunspot number peaked at a value of 96 on October the 28th, down from the cycle 25 high of 124 recorded in September. The big news is that two old cycle 24 regions surfaced during the month of October. The first appeared on October the 24th at latitude north 01. The second active region emerged on October the 29th at latitude south 04. As with all such active regions in this very late stage of the old solar cycle, both dissipated away a few hours after they emerged. This is both bad and good news as it confirms that the magnetic bands from cycle 24 on the Sun's surface are still interfering with cycle 25 activity. But it does explain the drop in solar activity during October. Robert hopes that November turns out to be the month when, as he puts it, we can shake the monkey. Amateur band conditions are picking up, especially on 15 and 10 metres. 15 metres had solid openings between Europe and the east coast of the USA for both days of the CQ Worldwide phone contest. 
10 metres had solid trans-equatorial propagation on both days of the contest, and the big guns were able to bag European stations on 10 metres for valuable multiplier points. Robert wishes the best of luck to all contesters in the CQ Worldwide DX Morse contest, which takes place across November the 27th and the 28th. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike with your month ending October 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, in October we welcomed Ireland and India to Parks on the Air, so please join me in saying Gia Hoich and Namaste to our newest poda friends. Also in POTA news, October was another record-setting month with an all-time high for both number of activators and number of QSOs, with 1,630 activators making a combined 329,019 QSOs. POTA is excited to officially announce that for our 2022 Summer Plaque event, we will be adding several plaques for DX QSOs. There will be up to six DX plaques available pending sponsorship one each for most QSOs made as an activator outside of the continental United States for IARU regions 1, 2, and 3, and one each for hunters that make the most QSOs with activators in those same regions. If you or your organization is interested in sponsoring one of these new DX plaques in 2022, please send an email to n3vem at parksontheair.com for details. And now for our monthly stats update. As we mentioned in our news item, October was yet another record-setting month for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 329,000 contacts made by over 1,600 activators. These activators put over 3,600 Parks on the Air from 27 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were KB3WAV with 3,631 QSOs and KU8T who activated 72 different Parks. The top hunter for the month was KC4TVZ with 1,541 QSOs while hunting 971 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Canada was once again the most active entity outside of the continental United States with 18,471 QSOs. The most active entity outside of North America was Japan with 5,045 QSOs. The top DX activators for the month were VE3GKT with 1,834 QSOs and VE7NB who activated 40 parks. Outside of North America, the top activator was JF7RJM with 1,205 QSOs from 31 different parks. For October 2021, we're introducing the first of our monthly bonus features. This segment will cover a variety of short format topics in a variety of ways. This month, we'll be sharing an FYI corner topic, multi-park activations. To understand two-firsts, three-firsts, etc., we need to first recall the very first rule of POTA. The activator and all of the equipment you use must be within the perimeters of the park and on public property. By way of example, if you have two parks that overlap and the operator sets up all of their equipment in the overlapping area, this counts as a twofer and two logs can be submitted, one for each park. If, however, the operator's equipment is outside of the overlapping area, Park 2 would not count as being activated because the first rule of POTA, being entirely inside the bounds of the park, has not been satisfied for that park. For parks that do not overlap but are simply adjacent to each other, a twofer cannot be done because there is no way to set up your equipment to satisfy the rule number one for both parks. Activating mobile from the side of a public road that has a park on either side presents the same issue as our previous example because there is no way to be physically inside the bounds of both parks at the same time. If, however, the public road passes through a place where both parks overlap and there is a safe place to pull over and activate, you can do so for two for credit by submitting two logs, one for each park. We hope that this short topic has clarified any questions you might have around twofers or threefers. Again, simply remember the very first rule of POTA. The activator and all of the equipment you use must be within the perimeters of the park and on public property. This concludes our October 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73.
A new IARU document proposing greatly enhanced band planned allocations for digital modes such as FT8 is available to download. As an example, in the case of the 20 meter amateur band, it's proposed that data segments should be allocated as follows. 21 kilohertz bandwidth for time sync data modes such as FT8 and FT4. 24 kilohertz bandwidth for conversational digital modes such as Olivia and Domino. And 19 kilohertz bandwidth for automatic unattended transmissions. Commenting on their website, the Irish Radio Transmitter Society said that the objectives were to review the data modes usage of the amateur radio HF spectrum and proposed changes that reduced intermode conflict between dissimilar operating modes and to facilitate the expansion of new technologies. In conducting the review, the IARU said that it was considered necessary to update the manner in which band plans were created. Accordingly, the groups studying this issue have modernised IARU's Band Planning Definition Toolkit and added additional data mode definition characteristics to help separate out on-air activities that are fundamentally incompatible within the data mode family. With the band planning process updated, the band plans of all three IARU regions were studied, focusing on the data subbands and taking into consideration mode popularity and capacity requirements, as well as existing band users and intermode compatibility assessments. The proposal document is available for download on the IRTS site at www.irts.ie and then follow the link to the 2021 HF Band Plan Revision. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently I exchanged emails with fellow amateur Gary Victor Kilo to Oscar Victor Alpha. This was his most recent response. Hello Ono. What have you been up to in amateur radio lately, you ask? <laughs> I hope this gives you a good chuckle. I decided to construct and erect a full-wave 80-meter sky loop, simple antenna, and I have lots of space to do so, with an old tennis court on the block, surrounded by existing poles and wire mesh. The preparation for me was the key to having an easy path to a successful outcome. First step was to measure out the existing poles for the best fit, Measured, then stood back and looked, then measured again. Yes, all is good, this will work. Made up the ropes and pulleys, rechecked the length and height. Yep, all good. Put the ropes and pulleys in place, ready to attach the insulators. I'm going for four corners with an overall measure of 23 metres long by 17 metres wide, using a corner feed point. Made up a feed point, cockatoo deterrent. 90 mil stormwater pipe, about 15 inches long, split end to end then zip-tied it into itself as it wraps around the insulator and feed point. Cockatoos are in abundance here, so I had to come up with something to keep them away from the feed point, as that seems to be their favourite chew spot. Purchased a 100 metre long roll of green and yellow earth wire, thinking to myself, easy as, just cut a measured length off the end and have the correct length left on the reel ready to roll out. Oh, but wait! A couple of hams talking on air had a similar situation and it worked out that the roll was shorter than quoted on the label. Best practice here is to unroll it and measure it myself. Simple task. Now I cannot find my 30 meter tape measure so I put the task on hold till it turns up. Two weeks later it is nowhere to be seen so now I have decided to go with the 8 meter tape measure. After thinking about how to best measure 8 meters at a time I came up with a marvellous plan. I'll put a couple of pegs in the ground at 8 metres apart and simply loop the wire back and forth 11 times. After all, this is 88 metres in total and I can simply trim the length to my chosen frequency of 3.620 MHz. I'm feeling very good right about now as I've saved myself a lot of walking and bending. Now, the first error pops its little head. After I cut the wire to length and attempt to lay it out on the ground inside the poles, designated antenna holders, the copper wire reminds me it has a memory. That memory is very adamant. I'm a sickle of loops. So yes, I now have a bird's nest of yellow and green. Have you ever noticed when something like this has a mind of its own? It is, apparently, right. Took at least an hour to unravel it, then several tent pegs to get this wire to obey me. So I won that battle. Because I had measured the wire myself, I knew it to be accurate which proved how wrong I was back when I'd completed the original measure, post to post for potential mast poles. So I reset my ropes and pulleys to the new poles and hoisted the whole lot up in the air. 
then ran inside to view the antenna analyzer. Now, something is wrong. I cannot get a meter dip anywhere on HF. Oh dear, I've got a break or a bad connection. So into troubleshooting mode goes what's left of my brain. Track and retrace. As much as I did, I could not identify what was wrong. Only one thing for it. I will go back to the beginning and start over. Dropped the wire on the ground, pegged it down so it could not get away again. Still could not find my 30 meter tape measure, so out comes the 8 meter tape. But wait, is that a 6 or an 8 on there? Let's settle this. I put on my reading glasses just to be sure. Yep, it's a 6 meter tape measure, not 8. So therefore I've only got a 66 meter length of wire. Oh gosh. Back to square one. Move all the pulleys, remeasure everything. To correct the problem, I had to add on some wire and solder the two pieces together. With my new level of cautious approach, I managed to get the length perfect at 3.625 MHz. I still cannot find my 30 meter tape, nor can I find my 8 meter tape. But the good news is, I still have a 6 meter tape measure. Actually, out of the 6 tape measures that I had, it's the only one I can find. I've decided I should probably wear my glasses when reading small print from now on. I've been making wire antennas for years and never had an issue. Having just moved here a couple of years ago, I'm in a position where size does not impact my antenna choices, hence the ambitious project which took up way too much time and effort. And if this is suitable for sharing, please do so. Cheers from Gary, Victor Kilo 2, Oscar Victor Alpha. The only thing remaining is to ask you a question. What have you been up to in amateur radio lately? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Radio amateurs were involved in a recent exercise in the Dominican Republic to prepare the Dominican population for responding to an evacuation process in the event of an earthquake. Members of the radio club Dominicano, H18RCD, participated in the drill. The club reports that a team of radio amateurs properly assembled an activated repeater the effort serving as practice and a demonstration to measure the time needed to restore communication as part of the simulation. The Dominican government, through the Emergency Operations Center, carried out the successful simulation and national evacuation drill, which achieved all eight of its objectives. The prime objective was to exercise the contingency plan in case of an earthquake. The goal was to strengthen preparation and response of public and private institutions as well as the population should there be an earthquake considering the additional complications imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, the exercise was aimed at validating the activation mechanism of the Emergency Operations Center if a seismic event were to occur, verify the evacuation process for public, private, and family institutions, review the activation procedure of such specialized response groups, as urban search and rescue and emergency medical teams. Ratify the procedure for activating the emergency telecommunications mechanism. Verify the installation of one mobile hospital. Supervise the installation and operation of a mobile command post and examine the tsunami communication protocol between ONAMET, the Dominican Republic's National Weather Service, the National Seismology Center, and the EOC in the case of early tsunami warning. Within the framework of the drill, the population reported their participation through a digital platform designed to receive images and videos about the evacuation process of institutions, families, and companies. The recent announcement of a pending three-month de-expedition to activate Crozet Island, FT5W, in 2022 and 2023 has generated enthusiasm within the DX community. For more details on the proposed de-expedition, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report courtesy of the AWRL Audio News. The Northern California DX Foundation pledged $20,000 to support the de-expedition. The point person for the planned event, Terry Maisel, F6CUK, wants to temper any overblown expectations as demand for Crozet will be extremely high as it is the third most wanted DXCC entity. Terry says nature-related factors, including climate, will dictate the manner in which the de-expedition takes place. As he explained, the wind blows almost constantly at more than 40 miles an hour, with gusts that can reach more than 90 miles an hour within a few minutes. Added to the possibility of gale or hurricane force winds is the fairly hard volcanic rock that covers the archipelago. These and other factors will severely restrict the sorts of antennas that might be deployed. 
the expedition planners are pondering the best solution for the best antenna possible. The last ham radioactivity from Crozet was in 2009. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. There are no real seasons on Crozet, so these conditions apply all year long, even if, during the austral summer, nicer days can be expected. For bird protection, antennas, guy wires, and anything that could be an obstacle are forbidden, Therry and Granger said. Just securing guy lines for a four square would require more than 30 concrete blocks because digging holes is not permitted. The original idea to erect four square arrays for 40 and 20 meters was refused, they said. The French Austral Islands are United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization World Heritage Sites and declared as protected areas. The only possibility that the administration allowed was to have an antenna attachment point to an existing building and have wire antennas from there, Therian Granger said. No beam. This is clearly stated in the permit we received. As if those weren't enough roadblocks, any equipment brought onto the island must be thoroughly cleaned to prevent the introduction of pollen, seeds, or non-native organisms. The expedition planners are pondering the best solution for the best antenna possible. As was reported, the last ham radio activity from Crozet was in 2009 by Florentin Bard, F4DYW, who operated as FT5WQ. Contrary to earlier accounts, the 2022 to 2023 de-expedition has not announced its call sign, which will not be made public in advance. The solo de-expedition is anticipated to cost as much as $58,000. The Twitter account is at Crozet 2022, and a website is expected to be online soon. When it's up and running, it will include details of how donated funds will be applied. Therry has pledged that all contributions will be refunded if the operation does not take place. At the end of this week in South Africa, it's exclusively geared towards the new guys coming up in the ranks with comfortably sedate Morse activity with a minimum requirement of 8 words per minute but not exceeding 12 words per minute. The event runs from 04 UTC on Sunday the 14th of November to 16 hours UTC on Saturday the 20th of November. Central African time in South Africa is two hours ahead of UTC. The idea is to make as many contacts as you can within the seven-day calendar period. You should log all contacts on the Radar Sport Log, developed by Eddie Zulu Sierra 6 Bravo November Echo. This can be found at www.radarops.co.za forward slash ZS portal. You will need a login pin, which Eddie will gladly send you in order to take part. Your Morse must be sent using any paddle or straight key at a maximum 12 words per minute character speed or slower to qualify to participate. You will need to declare in the comments column on the logging system what kind of key you used. The radar system automatically generates the points. Participants should encourage others to make use of the online logging system. Bands permissible during the activity are 40, 20 and 80 meters. You may not work the same call sign more than once on each band, but each day you start afresh. You can rework the same amateurs you did the previous day. The exchange will be the standard CW formal exchange, so long as it's a real contact. And your contact may also move into a full-blown contact, if you like. Hams have always believed that if you really want something, sometimes it's better to build it yourself. Nowhere is that more evident lately than in Japan where radio operators were disappointed once again this year by cancellation of the nation's major HamFest event. The Tokyo Ham Fair was canceled again this year by the Japan Amateur Radio League because of that nation's pandemic regulations. The virtual HamFest 2021 has taken its place thanks to the creativity of a group of independent, dedicated radio amateurs. Scheduled speakers included Shiro Sakai, JH4PHW, explaining the best practices for using EQSL and Yuki Shimizu Wii J02ASQ, explaining amateur radio satellite communications. One of the biggest topics on the agenda was the resurgence of CW. A true homebrew project built on the Zoom platform, the November 13th HamFest was designed with a major stage for seminars and live presentations. Other features included booths and a space for eyeball QSOs. The organizing committee was headed by Taka 7K1BIB, who said that like all major AM radio events, an on-the-air component was also a big part of the plan. As a social experiment, an international FT8 QSO party was to take place on 40 meters in parallel to the virtual event. 
Meanwhile, amateur radio operators in Slovenia held a quiet but well-earned celebration during the first full weekend of November as they mark their nation's arrival as a registered region in the worldwide flora and fauna program. It was the culmination of two months of intense effort by a team of hams, including Mike Grigoric, S55GX, who said the team members are all experienced SOTA, IOTA, and World Castles Award activators. Mike, who has been a ham since 1995, said that he realized this past summer that Slovenia needed to organize and become part of the awards program, which would require adding a national log manager and coordinators. Worldwide Flora and Fauna Vice Chairman Manfred Meyer, DF6EX, and Member Administrator Luke Watershoot, ON4BB, encouraged the Slovenian team's efforts. Mike, who serves as coordinator, went on to say that the team pulled all the essential ingredients together, a web page, an S5 logo, and the definition of all new activation areas. Mike said that there are now 191 such sites and the numbers are growing. Some other possibilities are growing too. Mike hopes Slovenia's participation will encourage more portable operation and even boost amateur radio tourism from abroad. The digital amateur TV magazine known as CODA TV has published its final issue. In a publishing lifetime that lasted for eight years with 100 issues, the amateur television magazine, CODA TV, filled a gap left by the demise of two earlier ATV magazines and had been widely read among enthusiasts. That era has ended with the publication of its latest and last issue, released in October. The production team's Trevor Brown, G8CJS, writes in his 100th issue that all good things must come to an end, and CODA TV is no exception. The digital-only publication reports that it received more than 500,000 downloads during its lifetime and was welcomed by readers who had lost Dare TV, Amateur, published in Germany, and Repeater, published in the Netherlands. CODATV credits Ian Pawson, G0FCT, who introduced the magazine in 2013 as a digital publication and served as its editor. The magazine, which also became available as a PDF edition, is making all of its 100 issues available for download. Space physicist Martin Archer of Imperial College London wants to know the best approach to making space physics data audible. Archer is the UKRI or UK Research and Innovation Stephen Hawking Fellow in Space Physics and Public Engagement and is working in the fields of citizen science and data sonification. He is seeking individuals to complete a survey, the results of which may help him to determine the best way to give space physics data a voice. Our sense of sound can be a powerful tool in exploring and analyzing data collected from satellites. But what is the best way to make this data audible, Archer asks. Space science researchers at Imperial College London are asking for input from communities with relevant expertise, such as those involved with audio, citizen science, music, public engagement, and science communication. HamSci founder Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, believes the list could also include radio amateurs. Given the connection between radio propagation and geomagnetic disturbances, along with the fact that hams are so used to listening to signals and noise, we think the amateur community would have valuable input, he said. Specifically, the project seeks the best method of making ultra-low frequency waves around Earth audible. Archer believes feedback from radio amateurs and others could help space scientists to improve science communication public engagement, and citizen science. Completing the survey should take no longer than 10 minutes. A participant information sheet offers greater detail. Direct questions should be sent to Archer via email. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. The only thing that worries me more than climbing to 400 feet on a July night with thunderstorms visible in the distance is climbing to 200 feet and then making a turn to the right and moving away from the tower six feet on a sidearm. Just the thought of making a sharp turn on a highway with no exits just doesn't seem natural. But for a climber, it's a necessary part of the job. For the safety-oriented climber, we work to minimize the risk of death. 
let's be honest here. If something goes very wrong on a sidearm, one of three things will happen. Death, poopy diapers, or serious injury. Let's examine some potential truths about sidearms. For openers, if the sidearm was about to fall off the tower, it would be visibly obvious just by looking at its mounting hardware most of the time. Also, if that structure survived the past year's worth of ice storms, 90 mile an hour winds, or worse without breaking, chances are it'll support my fat butt for a short amount of time just fine too. Since tower climbers usually own lots of straps, belts, and ropes, we have the ability to choose how we want to protect ourselves when working on sidearms. Basically, we can choose to secure ourselves to the tower or if we want to secure ourselves to the sidearm at all. Depending upon the width of the tower, the design of the sidearm will vary. On a one to two foot sidearm, many times I stay below it and stay strapped to the tower. I use two or three devices and lean out away from the tower so I'm just below the antenna I'm working on. If the antenna is too heavy to handle this way, I can secure it from above or work on it from above. If the sidearm is a big six foot mother, I prefer to climb out onto it to get my work done. What I do is use a very light but very strong rescue strap. It's about 10 feet long and strong enough to pull a car out of a ditch, yet light enough to carry in a big pocket. I attach it with two beaners about five feet above the sidearm on that side of the tower. The other end of the strap goes to my belt. I slide out onto the sidearm and often never strap onto it. Depending upon the width of the sidearm and the weight of the antenna I'm working on, I may never strap onto the sidearm at all. This way, if the sidearm breaks off the tower, I'll drop to the end of the strap and stop while the sidearm can fall away. If I was strapped to the sidearm too, my strap would have to catch all of that weight, which sounds like a bad idea to me. Again, each installation is different. One needs to know the age of the structure and look how well maintained it is and decide how to deal with safety based on a first-hand inspection of the sidearm. There is not much in nature that would put an equivalent weight load at the end of a sidearm equal to my 160 pound body weight. So a climber needs to be very aware of the risks and safety specs of his gear, not to mention the condition of the tower. The professional climber recognizes the danger and works to minimize the risk without losing lots of time and with minimal added weight. If you want to imagine a job I don't ever want is the guy that slides down the guy wires with the bucket of grease smearing a coating from end to end. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, former AWRL headquarters employee turned ham radio retailer John B. Barcherer, N1GNV, considers himself a casual contester with a 100-watt transceiver and a wire antenna. As the fall and winter contest seasons begin, he shared 10 operating tips for new contesters and those with modest stations. Number one, read the contest rules. Know which bands are in play, your entry category, and the contest exchange. Number two, use a logging program. Quite a few options are out there. B's personal choice is N1MM Logger Plus. It's free, has an amazing array of features, and it's updated regularly. Most current logging software will interface with just about any modern HF radio. Number three, more operating time means more contacts. Get rid of any distractions, such as texting, TV, and email, and concentrate on making contacts. However, B does suggest taking breaks. For five minutes each hour, get up, stretch, hydrate, and get some fresh air. Number four, set achievable goals. If you're not an experienced contester with a well-equipped station yet, it's not likely that you'll win a contest. Instead of trying to win, aim to beat your score from last year's contest. Try to work DXCC in a weekend, or try to outscore fellow club members. Number five, study propagation forecasts. Get a sense of what bands are likely to be open to areas you want to work and when. This will help you come up with a basic operating strategy. Band openings can occur at any time, so if you're operating in a category that allows it, keep an eye on the DX cluster to find out when a DX station is on the air. Number six, don't waste time in pileups. Early on in a contest, don't waste a lot of time trying to break the pileup. 
try a call or two, but if you don't have success, move on and try again later. Number seven, work multipliers. Most contests include multipliers in their scoring system, which can help boost your score. Typically, you multiply your contest points by the number of multipliers. For example, sections, states, DXCC entities, and grid squares to determine your total score. Number eight, know your radio's knobs. Familiarize yourself with your radio's front panel controls as well as any functions that may be hidden in a menu. Just about every radio has an attenuator, preamplifier, RF gain control, noise blanker, and frequently noise reduction. Most will also include an IF shift or passband tuning. Try turning off the preamplifier and turning on some attenuation. This may seem counterintuitive, but if a station sounds loud, chances are you're also loud to them. Reducing RF gain can also knock down strong, close-in interference, so you can hear and contact weaker stations that may be drowned out by a stronger one. Number nine, use standard phonetics. Cute phonetics may be okay to use on your local repeater, but in a contest, other stations will be listening for standard phonetics. Even though phonetics can vary, it's important to be consistent. And number 10, listen before calling. Make sure you correctly copy the other station's call sign and exchange, which you can enter in your log while waiting in line. This is especially valuable during the AWRL November sweepstakes, when the exchange is more than a simple signal report. Listen to the other operator's pattern saying QRZ after each contact, for example. And the best tip of all, make sure you're transmitting when the other station is listening. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters. The Amateur Radio Newsline. The Rain Hamcast. Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our web for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR and...